My name is Patrick Joseph Walsh, and I started at RCA in uh, 1957. Um, what was your first position at RCA? Well, I came in as a, I guess, a semi-project manager, okay? And uh, one of the first, uh, first projects I had was the uh, Philadelphia Police Radio System, <laughs> where they put in a new uh, RCA si uh, system over there which was, I think it was called car phone at that time. And uh, we put new antennas up around the city. I actually put one up on top of Willie Penn. And uh, I think I was on that job uh, probably about three years, something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm trying to remember the guy I worked for. He was a big wig in RCA. Had his own company at one time, but I just forget his name now. Forget his name. Uh, and after uh, after the Philadelphia Police Radio System, I went uh, to work on the Western Union Microwave System, which was a new microwave system uh, all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast hmm. with junction stations up and down in the middle of the country. And I probably spent maybe three years on that, something like that. And then... Uh, after that, it was various jobs, TV studios. In the late 60s, um, I went to Saudi Arabia um, to build a television station over there um, in a city called El Damam. Um, we put up a 1,500-foot tower there. And uh, uh, the first thing we put on the air was the old... Uh, Indian head test pattern, if anybody remembers the Indian head, <laughs> like Jim probably does. <laughs> and um, a lot of the Arabs didn't like it. Mm -hmm. um, when we would come into the TV station, they would throw rocks at us and things like that, you know, uh, until the prince came down and said, you know, anybody that fools with our new TV is going to be in big trouble. So that ended all that nonsense, you know, because they know they get their head chopped off or something. So, but uh, Saudi Arabia at that time was very, very primitive, very primitive. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if you want it, we got a telephone put in our apartment. Uh, well, they were on a new telephone line all the way from the telephone exchange uh, through windows and corners and on top of this and all the way to your apartment. So you'll see big globs of wires hanging out on the telephone poles and on the side of houses and things like that. But today it's probably a very modern city, you know. But at that time it was pretty scary. Matter of fact, uh, one time we went, uh, I had an Italian engineer over there uh, to check out the antenna because the antenna was built by Coel in uh, La Chiarella, Italy. And, uh, but it, was vended under the RCA name. That was our European distributor. And uh, we decided that uh, we would go see an old town um, where there are you know, actually uh, remnants of the wars and crusades and things like that. And the name of the town was Hafuf. And it was probably about yeah, 90 miles across the desert and across from the scarf and down the mountainside. And uh, we went there, and it was a very interesting town. And I had my translator with me. Uh, his name was Omar Sharif. <laughs> he used to say, I'm a big movie star. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, um, we, we stayed there overnight. There was about six of us. And um, we stayed in a, a chai house, which is a, a tea house. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get a wicker bed, and you can sleep there. Got up the next morning, we're getting ready to leave, and had a station wagon. And we're all going to the station wagon, and uh, people are starting to bump into us, throw stuff at us. Uh, what in the world is going on? And so I asked my translator, I says, you know, you get, what, what's the matter? What happened? So he got a hold of a policeman. He asked the policeman what happened. Well, what happened was the broadcast from Egypt were saying that the, uh, the Americans had burned down the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. So they're very upset about that. So we got in our car and um, 
they broke all the windows out, beating on it with rocks and whatever. <laughs> I figured these are the last days for me, you know. But anyhow, we got back to El Damam, and um, you know everything was fine there because it, you know, it was a modern city at that time. So, so that was the end of the Saudi Arabia job, and then from there, I believe I went to uh, Indonesia. And uh, it was a survey to build a microwave system across uh, the archipelago um, from um, across the main island of uh, Java into Bali and across. And it, it was an interesting trip. Uh, uh, we had a lot of surveying equipment with us, and I had a, a, a Canadian uh, engineer with me. And uh, we'd carry all this stuff up on high mountaintops or hills and stuff like that uh, to see where we could get clear microwave shots from one site to another. And what was funny one time, I'm, I'm up at this site, and the kids would follow us, you know, they're around from the villages. And this little girl come up to me, and she's rubbing my arm like this. And I asked my chance. What's, what's with her? He says, she's never seen a white man before. <laughs> she's wondering what's wrong with you. <laughs> but that's how remote some of these places yeah, were. Right. But anyhow, uh, we didn't get the job, so I never went back. Um, and where else did I go for them? Oh, I went to uh, Frankfurt, Germany, and built a uh, RCA studio uh, for... Uh, the Armed Forces Network. And um, that probably lasted about you know, four or five months, something like that. It was a small studio. But um, they liked to watch the, uh, uh, the uh, stuff from Armed Forces Network because they put on things like uh, Hogan's Heroes and stuff like that, and they thought that was pretty fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> and let's see, where do we go after that? Uh, uh, spent some time in Alaska. Uh, I w went up there during the Christmas holidays to relieve some guys. They were, we were building a cable system up there. So I went up to relieve uh, the project manager uh, for the holidays. I was up there for about two weeks. And let's see. And then uh, in 19... 77, I got assigned to the uh, World Trade Center project. And uh, there was a lot that went on with that project before I got to it, which I didn't even know about. But uh, all the antennas and a lot of the uh, steel was all in storage because there had been a conflict about coverage, whether they really needed to go there or what was happening. Uh, I don't know. But I don't know if there was lawsuits going on or something. But anyhow, they decided, okay, they're going to move from Empire State Building over to the World Trade Center. I said, okay, so we had to take all the antennas out of storage and um, get the steel ready and things like that. Uh, so uh, most of this uh, refurbishing was done at our plant in Gibbsboro. And um, it was... It, the project was probably worth more restoring it than it originally cost, you know, because you had to get everything out of story. All the antennas had to be retested again uh, completely. So in 77, uh, uh, I went to the World Trade Center just to you know, see, see what I'm up against there. Uh, we were taking readings to see if we'd get interference with our meters and stuff from other systems and uh, see how everything would work out. Um, so by probably late 78, yeah, I'd have to look at my presentation, but I think it was. They said, okay, it's a go. Okay. So there was a, a platform left in the middle of the World Trade Center, WTC1, which was the North Tower, for the antennas to be stacked on. Uh, and they left a, um, a crane on the roof to lift the materials in case it ever happened, the stuff would be there. So we started bringing uh, steel up, and uh, the first 
hundred feet. Uh, we call these sections AC, AC, which meant uh, antenna core. Uh, the first hundred feet uh, were standby antennas for um, the VHF channels mainly, like four or five and stuff like that. Um, and also, the first hundred feet of the tower was to be insulated because they were afraid in cold weather and high winds, you could get cracks in the steel. So they uh, put boots around the legs, the outside insulating boots, insulated everything inside. And the cap at the top of the first 100 feet was all steel and, and it was all sealed off because the transmission lines would go through that. But there was holes already for the transmission lines and boots to go around them to keep the heat in. So after that section got built, then we uh, then we put up the um, the gin pole. If I don't know, you know what a gin pole is. Anybody knows what a gin pole is? Well, your crane only goes so high. It can stack you up to about a hundred feet. Okay. After that, you got to put a gin pole on the side of the structure you're building. Okay. So there's there's um we call them bents which are the sink can fit into, and they, you know, it's strapped onto the tower that you're building. And as you go up, uh -huh. we move the gin pole up with us. Yeah. In other words, we might stack another 50 feet of antennas, and then we'll take the gin pole and we'll crank that up to the next level. And then we, we, we uh, cable it off. Yeah. And then we'll build another 50 yeah. feet or so. Then we'll move the gin pole up again. Eventually, the gin pole will be up to 400 feet. You know. So after that, we the next sections we set were I'm trying to recall um, were channels 41 and 47. One of them was um, Spanish broadcasting and. Although nobody could tell, we had mechanical tilt in those two antennas where the base where they would go was shaved slightly a degree or so to tilt it one way. Then the next antenna was tilted another way. You can't notice it by looking at it, but it was mechanical tilt. Um, other antennas, they use electrical tilt. Because if you have an antenna, you know, and it broadcasts out from 1,400 feet in the air, well, yeah. the signal will never hit the ground. Yeah. So they build an electrical tilt to tilt the signal down. Um, so we got those two guys up. And then it was getting to be winter. And we had a lot of storms. You, you could only work probably three and a half days a week up there because of the wind. In the winter time, you get rain and sleet and snow and everything else. Um, and in my presentation, you'll see I got, uh, you can't believe the amount of ice formed up there. But anyhow, um, we managed to do other work during the winter, which was running transmission lines uh, up through the stack itself. The, the stack of antennas when completed uh, weighs 400 tons. Uh, so then the next sections we set were, were like, um, triangular sections. And that was uh, channel two uh, with um, butterfly antennas. And um, channel 31 with VZ panels on the edges of the channel two antenna. And that was two sections we put up. Then after that, we put up channel seven. And after that, we put up channel, I recall, 13, I think it was 13 and nine, it was a combined antenna. And after that, it was channel 11. And after that, it was channel four and five, which was the top antenna, which was a combined 
uh, antenna for channels four and channel five used the same antenna. And um, of course, on top of that, we had the completion flag, which uh, the iron workers always do. And uh, we had another flag up there uh, for one of the iron workers' brothers uh, who got killed a couple days before on a job over in Brooklyn. And um, when you see some of the pictures of the presentation, they're pretty impressive because, you know, uh, all around the top of the building, it's like a railroad track. And that's where the window washers were. And they automatically go up over, down a track, and wash all the windows, come back up, move over, down a track. Um, then, let's see. We finished up, I guess, in the spring of 1980. Um, as far as RCA was concerned, I don't know, the World Trade Center may have other things to do. But we always had steel inspectors on the job with us, you know. Um, I remember Bobby Lockman was one of the steel inspectors. Uh, Jimmy Sullivan, steel inspector. And my main link to the World Trade Center, the the big guy there was a guy by the name of Lester Feld, who kind of watched the project and the money for the Trade Center. Um, just where did I go after that? Uh, I went to uh, I went to Chicago a couple times um, just to see what was happening there with the new antennas going up on the uh, Sears building. Mm -hmm. That was just a visit for a couple of days to look it over. You know. um, cause we had already put antennas up on top of the John Hancock building. Um, uh, let me see where we went after that. Oh, I wanted to tell you one story about one of the iron workers in the Trade Center. His name was Bobby Chismadia. Everybody called him Bobby Chis. Mm -hmm. He came to work. Suit, you'd think he was a Wall Street banker, and a briefcase. <laughs> and he'd put on his old overalls and he'd go to work. <laughs> and at the end of the day, he'd get a shower, clean himself up, put his suit on, get his briefcase, and go back to Long Island where he lives. And I said, Bobby, why do you do that? He says, Well, I ride the railroad every day. He said, I just don't want to look like a bum, and, you know. <laughs> so he, <laughs> he puts his suit on and grabs his briefcase and off he goes. But he was a good worker. Uh, we had a couple of Indians uh, on the job. They were, uh, you find a lot of them as uh, iron workers, the Indians. Um, um, and after the Trade Center, um, I was offered a job in uh, Van Nuys, California. For uh, RCA? Yeah, for uh, RCA Cablevision. So I went out to RCA Cablevision and uh, I, I was like in charge of the field projects, go out, make sure they're running right, things like that. And also the uh, design engineering department out there. Uh, but uh, th they were in trouble, the things weren't going good. And uh, after a couple of years out there, they shut it down. And I come back here. And um, I went to work for uh, project implementation back here. And one of the projects was the um, Gwen system, or the Gwen system, which was the ground wave emergency network. Uh, and it was uh, locating sites uh, for the uh, transmitters. Uh, uh, in fact, one of them is right here in uh, New Jersey Public Broadcasting. They have a Gwen site there. I assume it's still there. I don't know. And I worked on that for a year or two, and then I went down to um, Florida, to Kajo Key, where uh, we were going to pu put an antenna on a balloon that uh, the military has, where they can go up in the air and they can survey all the drug traffic and things like that. But they had an extra track down there in balloon, so uh, we were allowed to use that, and it was the broadcast to Cuba. Uh, on Channel 13, and it's still in operation, I don't know, but 
it, it, it worked out all right. But uh, these balloons were massive, you know, like big dirigibles or something like that, you know. And I think uh, all the um, all the hardware was General Electric. I mean, they, you know, they had big, um, looked like a diesel engines that drove these things around a circular track so they could position the balloon properly. And I don't know, balloons that could probably go up eight, 9,000 feet, something like that, on a cable, you know, like that. So you imagine the weight of that thing when it's up there. And after that, let's see, I came back and I worked on some miscellaneous projects, and then it was over. <laughs> And I, I left. It was GE by that time, and I left. And then I went to work for some various uh, companies uh, doing, the, you know, some field survey work for them and things like that. But it was mainly for uh, cellular telephone systems. Matter of fact, the last one I worked on it was in um, a couple years ago. It was putting uh, uh, Verizon equipment in on the... Uh, Market Street subway, because they had no coverage down there. And I was getting too old about then, and I said, that's it, <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going home. And that's where I've been ever since, and I had uh, serious health problems with my spine, and I just had to, I, you know, I, I couldn't even walk anymore or go anywhere. And. Uh, it was kind of ironic because uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, you know, and said, hey, you know, can you guys help me? And they said, no, we can't help you. You're too far gone. Uh, okay. So then I went to Cooper. Can you guys help me? And they looked at all the MRIs and everything. No, we can't help you. I said, hey, man, somebody's got to help me. Finally, they said, yeah, we'll help you. Well... <laughs> I'm maybe slightly better off <laughs> after a year uh, laying in bed almost, you know. Well, we're glad you made uh, it today. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the RC employees you worked with? Yeah, yeah. Um, most of us stayed together for a long time. One of the fellows that uh, you I... you like have a, a crew that were, went to all these places? Well, so, sometimes. Sometimes. No, no. We, it was it was like a project implementation department, and uh, you know everybody had their specialty, and uh, you know. But we were on the uh, we were in two building, I think on the fourth or fifth floor or something like that, and everybody had their own cage, you know. And, uh, uh, it depended what the job was, you know, like transmitters be this guy, you know, towers would be this guy, or me probably. Um, but some of the people there, there was maybe one or two people I worked with for over 30 years at the same same place. Other guys came and went and things like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it was a good experience. RCA was a great, great company. And it was a shock when GE took over. <laughs> but um, yeah. Did you have anybody who mentored you when you first came in? Yeah, I did. A guy by the name of Bob Venner. Mm -hmm. Which is, that's one project I forgot to tell you about. <laughs> uh, Bob uh, was, was pretty dynamic. Uh, tough guy to deal with. But uh, they assigned him to a project in Austria, uh, which is he uh, was building new TV studios. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the project. It escapes me for the minute. But um, he went over to get it started and, you know, get some of the engineers over there for the design work, what they really wanted, things like that. And then he went, he called for me to go over. So I went over and I probably stayed there six months, something like that, uh, helping him out. Uh, but I, I just, the name of the project escapes me. But uh, Bob and I remained good friends for many years. I mean, we kept in contact all the time. And... Um, uh, you know, I seen him do some presentations uh, to the Austrian government and TV people over there, and he would do it in German. <laughs> he was very good at it. <laughs> this stuff together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did you did you um, feel like uh, RCA 
fostered your ability to sort of learn new things and become oh, yeah. a, a yeah. stronger engineer? Yeah. yeah. How did they do that? Well, you know, the, just the experience you get on these all these different projects, you know. And I remember the name of the project. It was Österreich Rundfunks. <laughs> so they did, just by giving you great wide variety yeah, of experiences, right. yeah. you uh -huh. had to learn a lot. Of and things. they they sent us to a lot of schools too. Um, RCA did uh, mainly management schools, but I, I probably went to oh a dozen different schools. They sent me to school one time for, to learn computers, mm -hmm. um, mainly because the microwave project had slowed down. I didn't have anything to do. So they said, you want to go learn about computers? I said, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to school for nine months. And then one day, somebody came into the classroom, and they called me out. And they told me to go back where I was before. <laughs> Some microwave project came up or something they wanted me on. So that was my experience with the computers. Cool. What was the best thing about working for RCA? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It wasn't the money. <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth, because uh, I found out when I left and I went to work for some of these other companies, I made a lot more money mm -hmm. than I made at RCA. But, you know, RCA, you had, um, you know, you could rely on them, you know. I mean... You know, you had great insurance and things like this. You know, I never had to worry about a hospital bill or anything. You know, everything was covered. I loved it. Did you feel secure? What was the worst thing about working for RCA? I couldn't, I can't say anything bad against them. That's no, good. Can't do it. Yeah. GE changed things, so. <laughs> yeah, that's when you became a number. Yeah. yeah. So where did you? So you traveled all over the country, but where did, did you have a home here in South Jersey? Yeah, where yeah. Where did you live? I live in Stratford. In Stratford. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have a social life with your coworkers? Uh, not really. Yeah. A few of them, maybe, but not really. Mm -hmm. When I, when I lived in California, that was a big thing in California. <laughs> the, the social life, uh, mm -hmm. uh, renting buses on Friday night to go to Las Vegas, <laughs> uh, things like that. You know. The whole crew would go to Las Vegas, you know. Wow. Yeah, that was kind of fun. Yeah. And uh, uh, we, we had camping clubs in California where somebody would pick a spot to go camping. Everybody would get their camper and that's uh, how you spent your weekend. Nice. Now, when you first moved to Stratford, was it really different? Was it really did, was No, because I had lived in Jersey before. So, it, yeah. Did it grow a lot? Since I've lived there, yeah, yeah. sure. It, the, what grew was the taxes. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I first moved in there, my taxes were fourteen hundred dollars a year. Now they're eighty five hundred dollars a year. Same house. <laughs> um, but, did, did you have a lot of RCA people living near you? A few. A few. A few. And uh, we, we have a, a lunch club <laughs> that we still have today. I mean, every Friday. Uh, the ones that are left go to lunch together. At one time we had maybe 10 guys, but uh, mm -hmm. they, they left us. <laughs> and I don't know, one of, one of the great guys we had there was uh, Dana Pratt. I don't know whether you ever knew Dana Pratt or not, but he was a salesman at RCA. And he used to go to lunch with us. Mm -hmm. um, but I still have um, a friend from Gibbsboro, RCA plant. Uh, meets with us there, um, and a couple salesmen that mm -hmm. used to sell RCA broadcast equipment meet us there. But uh, there's like four or five of us left that go to lunch. That's great. So how would you sum up your experience at RCA? Was it just a job or...? No, it was a fun job. It really was. It was a fun job. And, you know, when you have fun at what you're doing, you know, it's, it's nice. It's comfortable. Yeah. I wish I could go back and do it again. <laughs> yeah, I really do. But uh, like I said, my last job was in two or three years ago, and I finally gave up. I said, I just can't do it anymore. You know? Now my wife, she, she won't even let me drive. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that probably sums everything up that I can tell you. 
Unless you can think of some unique thing that I, I'm not uh, knowing about right now. Thank you so much for uh, your time yeah. and all of your stories. No problem. No problem. You got a lot of international experience. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. They spread uh, you all over the world. Yeah. Did you like that it, part of your job? Yeah. Matter of fact, I'll tell you another story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a job in Israel. Um, they were going to refurbish a s studio or something. And they were going to put it in the, the Diamond House in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, my boss asked me, he says, you want to go over with us You know, when we negotiate the contract? I says, I can't go to Israel. Why not? I says, because I got Arab stamps all over my passport. Are you kidding me? <laughs> uh, he says, well, you got to go. He says, you know, they, they know how to handle things like that. I said, okay. So I think we flew to Switzerland, and we stayed overnight in Switzerland. And then the next uh, day, we flew into a lot airport, okay? And we got in there probably 9 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, something like that, you know? And uh, planes on the tarmac, you know, stops. And a uh, young guy with a sweater on walks on, you know, and uh, a soldier behind him. And he's asking for passports. Passport, passport. And he got back near me. And uh, passport, I showed him my passport. He says, Arabica. I said, no, man, I'm, a, I'm an American. Arabica. And the soldier goes, chuk, chuk. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I'm in some trouble here. <laughs> But uh, anyhow, they took me off the airplane, and they took another guy off the airplane. He was um, he was an Asian guy, like a Japanese or something. And what triggered this was it was just a week or two before, where the Japanese Red Squad had shot up Lot Airport. If you remember that, mm -hmm. they killed a lot of people in the airport there. So the Israelis were very sensitive. Um, so they got us out on the tarmac. And then a colonel came out and uh, told the pilots they got to get our luggage off the plane so they can inspect it. Got all our luggage off. They made a strip on the tarmac. So, and I even had little boxes of matches in my pocket I got in Switzerland. So they opened them up, see if anything's in it. They checked everything. And then this colonel, he says to me, he says, you know, I'm really sorry, Mr. Walsh, but we, we can't take any chances. He says, you get on the bus now, everything's fine. So I got on the bus, and then they started letting the people off, okay? And uh, my boss, his name is John, he comes walking down, you know, and he comes in the bus. He says, what happened, what happened? I said, nothing, John, they just wanted me to get a good seat in the bus, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my experience in Israel, which, which was Israel I enjoyed. It was very nice, very nice. And uh, we used to pick up, uh, we had rented cars, and uh, the soldiers hitchhike a lot there. They're going back and forth from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem or wherever. And uh, we'd pick them up. And they'd climb in the back seat with their carbines and <laughs> all the tools of the trade, you know. They carry everything with them. They're, they're always ready. You go into a cafe, and it was nothing to see, you know, rifles all leaning against the tables, you know. They carried everything with them. But it was an experience. It was a nice one. I enjoyed it. I've seen some of your presentation about 9-11. What was your feeling, what was your experience when you saw what happened with your antenna? I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I just didn't believe they could take that building down. I didn't believe it. But, uh, you know, one thing I've heard about why it came down, and uh, off the record, um, you know, the, the building was supported by the core <coughs> and the curtain wall. So there were no posts in between, you know. You get more floor space that way. So, and then the, the floor sections... They were like a cantilevered section, and they set them in place. You know, they bring them up, boat from down in Bayonne or something, and lift them up by crane and just keep stacking them up. <coughs> and they were supposed to have a, 
a lot of insulation on them, you know, like a foot of insulation or something like that. But because of environmental things and the EPA, uh, they don't even let them put a light coat of insulation on these things because they consider it too hazardous. And they say that's why these things got soft, started melting. And once they got soft and started melting, they're only anchored here and there. They just drop, pancaked one on top of the other, all the way down. Yeah. The other one was we've done quite a few of these interviews, and a term, the RCA family, keeps coming up. What's that mean to you? Well, <laughs> all I remember is the family store. <laughs> Uh, but, it, you know, it was, you know, like I've been telling all along, it it, uh, it was like a family, you know. You could trust people, you know. Most of them, 90% you trust. But, uh, no. No, it, it was a family, RCA, absolutely. I just hated to see it go. I don't know why it went, but... Uh, I guess there was some bad management in there somewhere, I don't know, or... They just wanted to unload it and get out of the business because, you know, these other companies were walking all over, especially the Japanese, especially broadcast systems. I mean, we, we made a camera that sold for $80,000. Japanese come in with one for $20,000. It works better. So who are you going to buy from? Not RCA. And that's basically what I've seen happen, even in the transmitters, you know. The Japanese transmitters were better, and uh, they cost less. Well, I hate to say that, but uh, I'm, that's my opinion of why the broadcast uh, department failed. You know, video switchers, the whole thing, you know. They, they should have gotten into the, you know, the, the computer systems quicker than they did to control the switching of video and things like that. And, of course, you know, at that time it was all NTSC. And, you know, I mean, that's ancient now, NTSC, you know. 